This is the American Law Journal. Who gets overtime? Why are managers getting tips you left for the waiter? And when is an independent contractor really an employee? Stay tuned. The wage and hour wars are just starting to heat up. Good evening. I'm Christopher Naughton. Welcome to ALJ. If you're classified as a professional, what does that mean? It could mean whether you get overtime or not. The legal's Gina Passarella explains. I'll wait for the chef to come and take me home, and I ain't gonna budge till he gets here. Labor battles, like the seasons, go in cycles, and wage, hour, and overtime litigation is in high gear. So there's a variety and is the hottest area of litigation at the federal level by far. The battleground, so to speak, is quite broad. You can go from anywhere from misclassification to overtime to gratuities. The biggest trigger is the Department of Labor dramatically expanding who gets overtime pay. What they've proposed to do is taking it from a level that's around $21,000 a year to taking it to a level in excess of $50,000 a year. So it's more than a 100% increase, which is of concern to a lot of employers. If these new proposals go through, you'll have a lot less litigation. It'll be clear because anyone who is paid less than $50,000 will not be exempt from overtime. But as employers are finding out, even well-paid employees may be eligible for time and a half did a presentation to administration and said, look, you guys are severely underpaying. Charles Cuddick is a highly skilled, well-educated physician's assistant, earning a six-figure income, aiding doctors with intricate cardiac surgery. But when it came to working overtime, his hospital employer told him, We were not going to pay you time and a half for your extra hours. I had always thought, is this really kosher? but I didn't know if I had any precedent or labor law to stand on. And I just looked in the mirror and I said, no, this is wrong. This needs to be corrected. So Cuddick filed a collective action and won. The court finding that physician's assistants are eligible for overtime because they're not members of traditional professions of law, medicine, and teaching. And a physician assistant, by definition, does not practice medicine independently. And while overtime issues are hot, litigation is also booming over this simple question. Who gets the tip? How long have you been here? A month and a half. Good tips? I don't make tips. Serious? So where do the tips go? The owner. I can't believe that. There's some pending against some hotel chains. So the claim is, let's say for a catering service or a banquet, there's a mandatory gratuity on the bill and the allegation is, well, that's not being passed on to the servers. And does it have to be? We're finding that this is unfortunately standard industry practice is that the hotel is skimming these gratuities and not remitting them all to the employees. And looming large on the horizon is the Uber class action lawsuit. Is someone classified as an employee or an independent contractor? The biggest things that we're talking to employers about are when you classify somebody as an independent contractor, not an employee, it has tax implications, which means the government is not getting its money. And if the government isn't getting its money, the Department of Labor will be watching, making employers skittish. I would tell employers and corporations really the same things I tell my kids, which is always do the right thing. If you pay your employees the right amount of wages, you won't get in trouble, so which is really a fair day's pay for a fair day's work. There's a real issue in this country with classification. Who is a salaried professional? Who is entitled to overtime pay? Who is an independent contractor? These issues have blossomed into national litigation and class actions. How we define and pay a large class of employees in this country may be changing. For the American Law Journal, I'm Gina Passarella. All right, three guests with me tonight. Another attorney will be joining us from Boston in just a few minutes. Jason Reisman joins us for the first time. Partner with Blank Rome, he practices employment law. With that top 100 law firm, concentrates on wage, hour, and overtime matters. He's also legal counsel with the Wage and Hour Defense Institute. Joey Price steps up to the plate for the first time here on ALJ. He's the CEO of Jumpstart HR, and they provide human resource services to mostly small 
and medium-sized businesses, offices in Washington, D.C., and in New York City. And Jerry Williams joins us tonight, plaintiff's attorney. With Williams Cooker Berezovsky, Jerry spends much of his time on civil rights and consumer protection matters, though the firm is also well known for its personal injury and environmental law. So now across the country, if you are making $50,440 annually or less, you're eligible for overtime, more or less, correct? That's right. And one of the things, one of the uh, reasons why the DOL says this is a positive step is that maybe ironically, from your point of view, Jason, it, it'll reduce litigation because it reduces the number of employees for whom there's this question, this uh, you know, eternal debate. Are they exempt or not exempt? Are they, uh, do they exercise independent judgment? Or are they governed by the overtime regulations or not? That, you don't have to answer that anymore for somebody who makes less than the $50,400. Joey, uh, from your perspective, again, with HR, was this a smart move by the DOL? I think it's a move that's headed in the right direction, but I think we're ripping the Band-Aid off too soon, too fast. But we have to account for the small businesses and medium businesses that may not have this acumen for what does it mean to classify employees? And what do you mean overtime is just for the 50K and over? Well, we may not have that many employees on our staff that are making that, and so it's going to be a huge burden for our employers of a smaller scale. And let's face it, this is rife with political implications, especially as we go into a presidential election cycle here. I mean, just take a look here on the screen what the DOL has. Fact sheet, middle class economics rewarding hard work by restoring overtime pay. A hard day's work deserves a fair day's pay. Five million more people eligible for OT. Did they overstep their bounds here, Chase? Well, they absolutely overstepped their bounds um, in terms of raising the salary by more than doubling it. And, you know, to go back to Jerry's point about litigation, I was just speaking with one of the district directors of the Department of Labor before a group of HR folks, and she said that the vast majority of the complaints that come into her office are based on non-exempt folks claiming that they're not being paid overtime properly. If we take five million more people and put them into that non-exempt class, I don't think litigation's gonna go down. At this point, let me ask Shannon Liss Reardon to join us from Boston. She is well known for being a tenacious class action attorney, litigator. She's taken on Starbucks, FedEx, and now Uber in wage and hour matters. And Shannon, maybe we can say this, the day of asking a quote unquote manager to work more than 40 hours and not get, getting paid overtime, perhaps that's behind us. Well, I. I think the reason why this change is coming about from the DOL and why I think it's a sorely needed change is exactly what's been talked about. We have been involved in a ridiculous amount of litigation over these past years about whether people making between $23,000 and $50,000 are or should be exempt from overtime. If we just have an across the board rule that they all get overtime, that is going to cut out a lot of litigation in the courts. and. You know, companies can deal with it. Frankly, what I think a lot of them are going to do is they're just going to lower the base pay for these workers and then calculate in how they'll pay them time and a half for overtime for their hours over 40, which they'll be allowed to do. So it doesn't really have to cost them anymore, but I think it's going to create a lot more certainty for everyone, both employers and employees, about what their obligations are. So, uh, you know, I, I support it. I think it's a great thing, even though it's going to cut back on the kind of litigation that lawyers like I are involved in. I think that, Shannon, what you're saying about the litigation, I think, is sort of uh, ignoring or brushing to the side the amount of litigation that goes on right now about all kinds of things involved in non-exempt, in the non-exempt world, meal breaks, rest breaks, after hours work, pre-shift work, whether the overtime rate includes certain things like bonuses and whether it's calculated properly. And if we jump up the number of folks who are due overtime, and have to learn all about the issues in timekeeping, recording time, when they can and can't work, I think the amount of litigation is going to skyrocket. And I think Shannon's going to be very busy, as is Jerry. Well, but it is the Department of Labor, after all. And the Department of Labor isn't really going beyond its bounds when it tries to set the ground rules for how labor is paid. And I think Shannon is exactly right. I think the effort here is to have certainty. There's always going to be a dispute. And of course, from the plaintiff's perspective, we would say because employers always miscategorize workers. Employers always have a tendency to, to uh, say a position is exempt when it really shouldn't be, it, precisely to avoid paying 
uh, over time, or in some cases to uh, avoid paying uh, the prevailing wage or minimum wage or, uh, or whatever other protections there are for the worker. So at least this cuts out one part of the argument. We know that if you make less than what is really uh, not a very extravagant salary in this uh, 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 economy, uh, you will have an entitlement to overtime unless you are exempt. And if the employer wants to make you exempt, let the employer justify and that. And again, category. the exemptions are, are somewhat narrow. I mean, I think that there are six categories. We've got them up here on the screen at this moment. But for example, in Pennsylvania, highly compensated individuals, not even a consideration. Not, in, and neither is the computer professional exemption. Let me move on to an issue that I know is uh, near and dear to the hearts of many here on the panel tonight. And Shannon, uh, you, you may be uh, most amongst them. And that's the tipping issue. I know that there are several firms here in our Philadelphia area that have really weighed into Sofitel and other uh, banquet facilities that have not been tipping the wait staff who put those banquets together. This is an issue that you've actually been fighting for years, no? Yeah, yeah, I've been involved in this issue for probably 15 years or more. Um, I've seen this issue, it's pretty endemic, unfortunately, throughout the hotel industry. And we've also had cases against restaurant chains and country clubs and catering companies and, and all types of employers in the food and beverage industry. And, and what they do is they charge customers a service charge. Sometimes they actually even call it a gratuity. And customers pay it because they think, you know, this is an extra charge that's going to help the staff. Um, and that's, that's a way of the employer being able to look like its costs or, or the prices for its banquets are a little lower than they actually are because customers are willing to pay these extra payments because they look like gratuities for the staff. But then the staff doesn't actually get the whole gratuity. The hotel pockets part of it or some of it gets used for paying management or non-wait staff. So, I've been doing these cases in Massachusetts for 15 years. We've also done cases in Hawaii, um, Florida, New York. They're, they're, it's happening everywhere. And you've ta you took on Starbucks, Shannon. Where is, what's the status of that right now? Because I understand it kind of what got batted back and forth between courts. Yeah, that was, a, that was a slightly different issue. What we challenged Starbucks for doing was the, the tip cup that you see right outside the register at almost every Starbucks location. Customers put money in that, and, and Starbucks was sharing that with low-level supervisors as well as baristas. So that violated Massachusetts law. So, so I brought a case here in Massachusetts, and we won that case. The supervisors were not allowed to share in the tips. And as a result of that, we got money back for the baristas who had some of their tips skimmed. But also in response, Starbucks raised the pay of their supervisors by close to $3 an hour, which was what we were trying to do. Our point was that it, it should be Starbucks who pays the supervisors, not the lowest level employee on the hierarchy, the, the baristas. I think it's a difficult path for the hospitality industry if they're not paying close attention. And I often say you really have to think before you engage in these um, service fees or other things. When you put a service charge out there and you're planning to give some of that to the workers and you're going to keep some of that, the question about whether it's really a tip and does it have to be included in their wages is a difficult uphill battle for the employer. So I think that it's important to think about that and for the employer to plan ahead and figure out if they're going to charge a service charge, that's fine. If they want to give the user, the customer, a chance to provide a tip that's going to go directly to the employees, the banquet servers, that's a great idea. But I think there's some thought that needs to be given to that. Right. Right. And I, I, I think what Jason maybe He's not saying it directly, but what he really means is there really shouldn't be a lot of disagreement among us on this panel about the tipping issue when things are truly tips, because the rules about tips are actually pretty clear if, if, if it's really a tip, and if it's not a tip being disguised as something else by, by the management. So I think, I think Jason's exactly right that this is a problem for employers because there are many ways of misusing the extra charges that a customer or a consumer pays uh, when it doesn't all go to the line level employee who's doing the work right. and who the consumer thinks he or she is tipping. Right, no, no problem sharing the tip with the busboy or the bartender, but now if the owner or the manager starts right. dipping into that till, then they've got, then they've got some problems. Right, and Chris, so, if I may add. Yeah, go ahead, Joey. What we're seeing conceptually, it's, it's a management issue. It's a training issue. Uh, Companies need to take the time to invest in training their managers and the key decision makers to properly and ethically uphold the law. 
so we won't have this litigation issue. If we're skirting around ethics and, and training our managers on how to conduct themselves appropriately with regards to tips, with regards to overtime, with regards to independent contractor or employee, um, that's where we have the, the, the trouble. It's, it's the human error, it's the failure to abide by law, but also we're negating the fact that maybe managers aren't being trained to uphold these laws. And you mentioned there uh, not only about, about tips, Joey, but also independent contractors. And let me uh, segue uh, to, uh, to Shannon here, because again, Shannon, you're taking on Uber, and you thought Starbucks and FedEx was big. Someone said, I don't know, Uber might be too big to fail. What of it? Yeah, so you're right. I've sued Uber for misclassifying its drivers as independent contractors. And, and by doing that, Uber has basically pushed all the, the costs and expenses of its business, or many of those costs and expenses, onto the workers. And, and the workers aren't getting the protections that they're owed under the wage laws and the employment laws. So we have a case going on right now. It's in California. Um, it, the court just certified it as a class action, so it covers thousands of drivers for right now across California, although my hope is if we're successful there, that it can turn into a national class action. Um, and we are we're suing to get back the wages that we think these drivers are owed by Uber. Why shouldn't these people be deemed as independent contractors? They basically, they use their own equipment, they essentially write their own ticket, they set their own hours. I mean, this goes back to, in some ways to some very classic uh, law school definitions of when someone's an independent contractor and when uh, someone is an employee. What's the strongest part of your argument that states that these people should be treated as employees, even if they want to be independent contractor entrepreneurs? Well, there are a bunch of factors that courts look at in determining who's an employee and who's an independent contractor. Um, the fact that you can set your own schedule and set your own hours, that, that's not the question. Um, the most important factor that courts look at generally is how much control does the employer have over you. And we have a lot of evidence that, that Uber actually has a lot of control over these drivers. It sets the standards. Um, it decides who can drive and who can't drive. It sets the prices. People can't, drivers can't negotiate how much they're going to charge. Drivers can't decide what rides they want to take and don't take because they'll get deactivated if they don't take pretty much every ride that's offered to them. Some other factors courts look at is, is this work being done in the usual course of business of the company? In other words, is this a company set up to provide the service that these workers are providing? And, and it is. Uber is a transportation service. The drivers are providing that transportation service to customers. It's, the company's tried to bill itself as a, uh, as a tech company, like a lot of these, these new startups from Silicon Valley are doing. But the courts have already rejected that. In, in my case against Uber, the court already said, Uber, you can't, you can't hide behind claiming that you're something that you're obviously not. You're not a tech company. You are a transportation provider. So those are just some of the issues. Didn't FedEx make a similar argument in, in a case that you took on against them? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so just as FedEx denied that it was a package delivery company, uh, FedEx claimed that it was a logistics operation who connected people who wanted to send packages with small businesses who wanted to deliver packages. And that didn't go over very well in the courts, who said, no, FedEx, you're a delivery company. Um, just the same as Uber is trying to say that it's not a car service. Um, but, but that's obviously what it is. So th those are just some of the factors. Again, setting your own schedule. Uh, there are plenty of employees who can set their own schedule, who have flexibility from their employers as to when they work or even how much they work. Just because you have some independence in setting some of the terms of your employment doesn't mean you're not entitled to the rights of employees under our wage laws. Well, let me say this, Shannon, in terms of uh, that case, I mean, I'm kind of glad I'm not involved in it with you because it is in crazy California. So we have to take that off the block for a second, realizing that it's not part of the federal law issues. But recently, the Department of Labor issued some guidance, which I don't really support. But in terms of the Uber case, I think it actually makes a pretty good point about Uber being more like the prototypical independent contractor relationship. I think a lot, a large portion of the Uber drivers are actually performing other jobs. They're working for other companies. They're in control. They're exercising their managerial skills to make a profit or perhaps result in a loss. That's a critical factor that gets looked at. And I think, again, taking California out of the mix, that changes things significantly. But the Uber drivers in this sharing economy, I think it is a prototypical example of independent contractors. Well, 
I'll, I'll, for once, I'll sort of play the middleman uh, here. I mean, I, I, I understand the point. I'm looking for support. I, from Joey. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, well, he, well, he's sort of more, more of a neutral, probably. But I, I mean, Jason has a point about Uber drivers. They are kind of a unique uh, category that we haven't seen before. There are a lot of part-time workers. There's a lot of people. There's a big mix of Uber drivers and a lot of Uber drivers that work in a lot of different settings for a lot of different periods of time and under a lot of different conditions. But I think it's important to remember that this, this particular type of classification, calling drivers independent contractors when they are subject to some very strong controls, this is, this is something that Uber learned from the trucking industry that did this for decades. They're still doing it for a lot of uh, the workers and it's caused a lot of problems in the economy. For one thing, it's uh, deprived the government of a lot of payroll taxes, uh, which uh, the government has gone about recovering in a lot of cases. But, but beyond that, it has also kept drivers from uh, controlling their jobs when they're supposed to be independent contractors. They, because they're classified as independent contractors, they have no choice really in what routes they accept and where, when they have to work and what kinds of loads they have to carry. And, and these are the hallmarks of a non-exempt employee. Shannon, where is, where's the litigation right now and uh, what are you forecasting for us? Well, the case just got certified recently as a class action. We're still fighting over the contours of the class action, but it's been set for trial next summer in California, next June. So I'm, I'm looking forward to that trial. Okay. A word of advice for some of those you have taken on. Uh, there's a pizza place up there in Boston. I guess they were former adversaries of yours. They were actually bilking some of the employees to pay off some labor fraud charges. I think I understand you actually ended up taking over that that pizza place and no longer the upper crust, now it's the just crust, right? <laughs> yes, that's right, that's right. Chicago or New York style? Oh, it's the best pizza anywhere, uh, local ingredients and, and the workers are, are treated fairly. Boston style then, right? <laughs> there you go. Boston, <laughs> Boston style. I want to thank yes, uh, yes, Shannon yes, Liss-Rudin yes. from joining us tonight from the law firm of Licton and Liss-Rudin again. She's done a duel with uh, Starbucks, FedEx and now with Uber. Shannon, thanks so much. We'll be keeping tabs on what's going on with that litigation for sure. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Have a good evening now. If I can add one more comment about the Uber situation. Go ahead, Joey. Absolutely. Uh, and, and to provide support for Jason, I do think that is Appreciate the prototypical it. independent contractor model. I mean, what we are experiencing here with the litigation, you're essentially litigating the American dream where you have the ambitious, enterprising individual signing up for an opportunity <laughs> to make more money on the side, perhaps pay off their student loans, perhaps get money for Christmas. Uh, so I think that by trying to litigate Uber and the opportunities that it presents for independent contractors, which I believe it is an independent contractor arrangement, you know, we're, we're actually doing the opposite of what's intended. I think that there is a lot of opportunity for independent contractors to grow and excel under Uber. And if you really look at a lot of the um, guidelines or the, the quote-unquote guidelines that, that Uber provides, a lot of them are best practices for you to excel as you grow it in your independent contracting arrangement. Uh, so that would be my take on it. I, I think we can't litigate the American dream here. Let, let Uber flourish uh, and, and see where things go. Let me ask a question of my remaining plaintiff's attorney on, yeah. on the set tonight. Is it becoming almost impossible to have people, quote unquote, hired as independent contractors. Do you think the way the DOL is moving, that they're putting some businesses in a vice that they should be exceedingly worried once they bring an independent contractor into their fold? No, no, I, I really don't think that at all. I mean, I think, again, the rules are fairly clear as they stand now, as they've always been. They're, the DOL is trying to make them clear, although putting in different thresholds. I think an employer that is straight up with its hires, that tells them exactly what their expectations are, that lets them exercise independent judgment if they are in fact independent contractors, or gives them benefits if they are employees and non-exempt employees, uh, will have no problem. Jason, let me ask you this question, as I gave him a bit of a cross-examination question. Isn't this long overdue? Haven't we really let independent contractors run amok or at least allow employers to really abuse the whole notion of independent contractors in this country? And it's about time. 
there's no question that there are some abuses in the independent contractor well, more than some, right? Especially no. with the immigration problem and, and lots of problems we've had in this country. People getting thrown off the rolls, finding jobs, and quote unquote, that notion of being paid under the table that all of us grew up hearing that phrase. As kids, we didn't even know what it meant. Now we know what it means, especially when we talk about immigration. So isn't this long overdue? I don't think so. I, I think that there is a problem, but I don't think you drop the bomb on a small problem. I don't think the Department of Labor goes off the deep end with recent interpretation or guidance and uh, takes things to the extreme. I, I've been practicing law for a few years, had a few independent contractor cases, been through it, and when I read the interpretation from this past summer, I thought they must have been talking about some other classification I'd never read about before. So I think they've gone wild. I think the Department of Labor under the current administration has become, just like real estate, been uh, enforcement, enforcement, enforcement. And this is one more aspect which they're trying to go in and take everybody down who's got independent contractors. And I don't think that's the way it should be. I think that there are valid independent contractor relationships, and every employer across the country is scared now. And that's not the way we should operate business in America. That's funny because I seem to remember a Department of Labor under some previous administrations that employers and their lawyers loved uh, because they uh, rendered opinions making many employees uh, exempt that they're, or opining that certain categories should be exempt. One thing Jason's absolutely right about though is that what the Department of Labor does is not done in a vacuum. It happens in a political setting and uh, it, the climate now may be a, a, at least federally may be a little more pro-employee than bit, it was. Huh? <laughs> Got a nice understatement, Jerry. <laughs> that's that's what he did. He did mention previous administrations <laughs> did. without naming names. He did. Joey, uh, the wages of sin is death. So I would have to say that if you are an employer and you're not dotting the I's and crossing the T's with independent contractors, if you're taking some of that gratuity money, if you're not making sure that the person fifty thousand and under is getting overtime pay, you are opening yourself up to some very big numbers. That is absolutely right. You're opening yourself up to a lot of numbers. I think that this, this issue should not be about enforcement, but it should be about education and making the small to medium-sized business owners aware of the implications, reminding them and refreshing them of, of the penalties, and then injecting them, whether through a, con a consultant or an HR person on staff, reminding them, okay, well, here's how we need to manage our workforce. We need to make sure that our, our, our policies are ethical, our policies abide by the book, and we are not sidestepping the law. Probably. Jason, I'm going to give you the last words tonight. Uh, look into the crystal ball. Is it murky for your clients? It, it's definitely murky, but there's one thing that's crystal clear. Change is coming. The rate, the rate of salary or the salary amount level is increasing, no doubt. Exactly what it will be, we're not sure, but probably the one thing that in the crystal ball I can't tell you about, but is something everyone should be concerned about, is whether they also change the duties test for the exempt status. So for all employers from a practical standpoint, think now. Do your own internal audit. Look at those classifications where you may have some questionable between 23 and 50,000 figure out how many hours those people work, what will you do if you have to reclassify, and put your plan together and think about how you're going to communicate it, because those are the most important parts of running a good, solid employee relations approach, as well as minimizing the risk of running into Jerry or Shannon. Jason Reisman with uh, Blank Rome, who spends most of his time on wage, hour, and overtime matters. Joey Price with Jumpstart. HR in Washington, D.C. and New York City, and Jerry Williams, plaintiff's attorney with Williams Cooker Berezovsky. Thanks, one and all. We could definitely spend another half hour on this. I'm attorney Christopher Naughton. Thanks for joining us this week. Until next Monday night, case closed. This week's American Law Journal has been made possible in part by Law Catalyst, legal media and marketing for lawyers. Go to lawcatalyst.com. Scheller PC, since 1977, its mission has focused on one thing, protect the rights of individuals harmed by others' negligence or corporate misconduct. Representing people injured by dangerous drugs, faulty products, and whistleblowers in False Claim Act and key TAM matters. Beatty, Sloan, and DeGenova, 
Decades of experience providing personal attention to those injured at work or suffering from serious injury due to medical malpractice, defective products, motor vehicle accidents, and other causes. With offices in Philadelphia and Haddonfield, New Jersey. And the Legal Intelligencer, an American lawyer media company, and the oldest daily legal newspaper in the United States.